Okay, good afternoon. This is CIVE 634, um, Surface Water Hydrology. Today is class number 131, which is uh, the 13th week, the first uh, lecture of two lectures. And I am Professor Victor Pons from San Diego State University, Department of Civil Engineering. And the subject today is uh, channel routing. Uh, last week, we've completed the treatment of catchment routing. And now we're proceeding for the next uh, two weeks to cover the subject of channel routing. So let me first say that the subject of routing, specifically channel routing, is very dear to my heart because that's what I started doing back in the year 1973 when I, when I joined Colorado State University as a graduate student, a doctoral student. Uh, Professor Mahmoud asked, asked me to do sediment routing, and of course I didn't know anything about it. So I started, I did sediment routing for three years. And in the, in the midst of that, I learned how to do channel, uh, water routing also. And so in 1976, I started doing water routing. And it, to my amazement, in one year, actually it was less than that. It, in three months, we came up with the solution to what I call my S curve, because it is mine, uh, which solves the, completely the problem with channel routing. To that day, there were some uh, mysteries about it, but after, the, after Professor Ponce's S-curve, there is no mysteries. So I'm going to very clearly talk about that subject because I happen to be in the know, as they say. And unfortunately, though, it is a very difficult subject. It has taken me a long time of a tremendous amount of effort to master this subject. So I am asking you to hold on to your seats. Uh, we're going to recover relatively fast because we don't have time, obviously. Today, I intend to cover four of our items, at least four, because, because we, got, we got 20 items to cover and we only have three lectures because we have a, a holiday uh, the second week, next week, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. So we have three lectures to cover 20 references. So I'm gonna go kind of fast. And I'm uh, asking you to uh, go along with me and read them the material afterwards. Uh, spend some time reading the material. And as you read the material, uh, you will uh, have any questions. If you have any questions, of course, you can always get back to me. Uh, uh, that's basically it. Um, uh, any one of these subjects, could, could you could spend a whole lot of time on it, but we're not going to. So the first thing we need to do is to classify the waves that we're going to deal with into three. Kinematic, diffusion, dynamic. And unfortunately, there's a misnomer in the classification due to a gentleman back in the year 1973, how interesting. This gentleman, his name is Danny Fred. Uh, he was doing a doctoral uh, degree or dissertation in hydraulics at the University of Missouri Rolla. And he, uh, in my opinion, made a mistake and called something something else and then let the confusion, and the confusion still persists, which is, which is okay. It's gonna take a long time to remove the confusion. But we have classified not we, but I mean, the, the, the profession generally uh, accepts the names kinematic, diffusion, dynamic waves. Uh, kinematic waves exist since about the year 1955 on a paper by Lighthead and Whittem. Although Seven, working out of the lower Mississippi River in the year 1900, already identified these so-called kinematic waves, only that he did not call them kinematic. He just said, this is the procedure or the way that the river will behave, will behave. And he measured the speed of these waves, interestingly. That 7 1900, very famous paper. In 1955, a couple of British gentlemen, Lighthead and Whittam, came up and realized what Seven had done and started calling it kinematic wave as in, as it was in opposition to dynamic wave. So that's the beginning of the story. Uh, that's on the kinematic wave equation. What is the kinematic wave equation? It's a wave as opposed to dynamic wave because you know kinematic is always opposed to dynamic or as compared to dynamic. Uh, kinematic wave does not, um, or rather moves mass instead of energy because the dynamic wave is supposed to move energy, right? At least at that time, people were a little bit confused as to exactly what is it, what is it, what does it mean to say transport of energy vis a vis transport of mass? But in this case, uh, Lighthead and Whittem uh, came up with this equation 99 in here. And then they said that that was the continuity equation. 
but in terms of the equation of, of uh, energy or momentum rather, they simplify the equation of momentum to a statement of, of uniform flow, which is equation 910 over here. Let me add, increase the size a little bit here. Equation 910. So then you can have the Manning or the Chessy and you can put them in this form in here and then you can combine them. And all this stuff in here is, is, is calculus and algebra but it is re related or designed to get you to 917, which is the actual kinematic wave equation of light, heat, and Wittem. These people were the first, apparently the first people that described this equation in that form, 917, the kinematic wave equation. And the thing about this kinematic wave equation is that it is uh, first order, meaning there are no squares. It's a first order partial differential equation. If it were a second order, we would have to have a second order derivative and this one, 917, does not have it. Now, note that 917 has a, has a total derivative dq over dA in the front of the second term, which can be replaced or has been replaced by its equivalent beta V, V where V is the velocity and beta is the exponent of the discharge area rating. Uh, and these things, of course, can be proved to prove, prove to be, we can prove that that is in fact the case. Okay, so we follow here with some very uh, sophisticated math, uh, which um, we, we reach the conclusion that these kinematic waves are, do not attenuate for two reasons. For the reason it said in there, uh, 919, the absence of wave attenuation can be explained by resorting to a mathematical argument the QDA can be replaced by dx dt, with, and that is equal to the total derivative. So that means that uh, the Q remains constant in time for waves traveling with celerity the QDA, which is correct. This is exactly what Seddon found in the year 1900 in the lower Mississippi. He was, he was measuring the lower Mississippi, and Mr. Seddon, with due respect to him, he's a great, he was, I think he was a great guy, or he is a great guy, he's dead, of course. Uh, but um, he was not, not a theoretician. He was a practical man measuring st stages and discharges over in the lower Mississippi. And he came up with, uh, with a statement like this. He says, this DQDA is a fundamental law of the river. And he says, all rivers are going to conform to this DQDA, meaning the derivative, this, the, the slope of the rating discharged area is a slope. It, it, the discharge area is a curve. And it has a slope. At any point, it has a slope. That slope is the DQDA developed by uh, or discovered by Seddon, which in fact, it is a velocity. In fact, it is a celerity. If we look at 916, we have DQDA equal beta V. So beta, beta V is a celerity too. Note that this beta is typically more than one. So which already tells us that the kinematic wave celerity exceeds the velocity. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a channel with a Manning equation equal to three, three feet per second velocity, the wave, the kinematic wave, it's gonna be five feet per second. Why? Because the beta in a Manning situation in a wide channel is typically uh, five thirds. So three times five thirds is equal to five. That's as easy as it gets. Then we discretize the kinematic wave equation. Why do we discretize? because we have to solve it on the computer. Let's not forget that when Leighton and Whittem did their work in 1955, that was the onset or the beginning of the computers. They could not even ima ever imagine what was gonna happen 20 years later. But in, in the year 1965, 10 years later, we were already solving numerically this equation and it had to be discretized in order for, it, for us to solve it numerically. So the discretization is done like this. Now, you guys may not be aware of what discretization means, but you cannot solve a computer problem without doing discretization. The, the computer works with digits and the digits are from a continuous that has been discretized. So take a de delta X and take a delta T. For us, it's, it's, it's second nature because we've been doing this for 50 years. But for you guys that have perhaps not done it, then you're wondering what the heck is this, but that's what it is. We're gonna be talking about a lot about this today. The order of accuracy, this went into my book. By the way, we're reading my book, my hydrology book. The order of accuracy. 
This, by the way, I should mention to you that when I wrote the book, I had a decision to make as to whether to include this material in there or not. And I figured that it needed to be included because no other book had it. And it, and it, is, it, it was a truism, it was true. And it needed to be told to the profession, to everybody, that that's, this is exactly what's the case. I, why do I say that? Because at the time we did this in 1989, the Army Corps of Engineers had a manual, uh, HEC-1 manual, in, the, in which they were misstating the problem, misstating the solution to the problem. Uh, not to say that they did it. The Army usually doesn't develop things. They actually have somebody else develop it and then they put it together in their manuals. So th that somebody else, I don't wanna mention names, had already developed a situation which was not quite right. And the Army picked it up. So we wanted in 1989 to straighten the, the path in here. And that's why we put all this stuff, which is extremely unusual for an introductory book in hydrology, but we felt that it needed to be done because somebody needed to straighten the path in here because they were off. Okay, and I'll explain that in a little more, in more time later. So here we're talking about how you have a first order scheme and a second order scheme, compare them and get the answers, which are different. And they all vary with the grid. They all vary with the grid. You can see in negative values even. So we were showing how you don't do this stuff. Okay, and then the first order accurate numerical scheme. And the first order accurate numerical scheme turned out to be uh, a, uh, an analog of the so-called Atkin method. What is the Atkin method? A-T-T uh, hyphen K-I-N. The so-called Atkin method, which is called, I'm sorry, I take that back. First, the convex method. The convex method was, the, it was a solution of the kinematic wave equation that was developed in 1954 by none other than Vic Marcus and his associates at the time they were producing the NEH manual 54. No, it's not NEH 54. It was NEH 4 manual, 1954. I made, I made a confusion in there. And they came up with the convex method because it was convex. Why did they call it convex? Because it never failed. As long as they were follow the rules, they were strict rules. And the strict rule was that the Quran number had to be less than one. Or the, they, didn't even, they didn't even call it the Quran number. They said the C coefficient which is very coincidental, the C Quran, right? But it was the Quran number. We came up with the name Quran number later on, 20 years later. But they, they said it, it could be less than, it should be less than one and we, it will be convex, it'll never fail. And since people at that time were already uh, aware or cognizant that the, that the computers could give you garbage out, right? So they, they, uh, they liked the fact that the convex method never failed. It never failed abruptly or grossly, but it failed all the time or almost all the time. It would be a guess if it actually got, got the answer correct. Why? Because the convex method was nothing other than the solution numerical of the kinematic wave equation. And, and it, was, it was wrong because it was trying to simulate not the, only the kinematic, but the diffusion part of the wave. And it, it had no way or no tools to do that. And therefore, it was coming up with a hit and miss kind of stuff. That's this, the state of affairs is about 1990 with the convex method. But prior to that, um, the convex method was the, uh, the star model for routing of the uh, soil conservation service. And the, um, um, the soil conservation service at the time sent one of their uh, engineers to Colorado State to study a PhD. They wanted to get people in school so that they can learn more, right? So this gentleman, his name was Fred Thurer. And Fred came up and uh, coincidentally in the year 1973 joined me. And we both spent two or three years, actually he spent two years because he was in a hurry. I was not in a hurry. I was there for three years. And, uh, and we shared uh, very nice moments of learning out there. And when he came back, uh, he, we, we discovered the, the issue or the concept of numerical diffusion. So we went back, no, he went back even earlier and told his bosses that the convex method was wrong. And of course that must have caused uh, an earthquake out there because they had been using it. Uh, they, I, I would say he went back in the year 1976 
in the convex, uh, the convex method was 1954. So for 18 years, they had distributed this model throughout the United States, et cetera. It was part of the TR20, the for technical release 20. So I wasn't there. I always say I wasn't there, but they must have got a, an earthquake out there. And finally, uh, Fred Thurer was a very um, persistent guy. And he convinced his bosses that the convex method had to be uh, overhauled. And they did that. And by the year 19, I, 1980, they had the so-called Atkin model that was supposed to be the, what they call it the first patch or the patch of the, of the convex. Patch meaning we're going to fix it. Okay, so this is an example of the convex method, which always works, but always works not quite right. That is the nice way of putting it. Okay, so I've already talked about the kinematic wave celerity. This is a fundamental, most famous, one of the most basic formulas of our field, in our field of routing, of hydraulic routing, hydraulic hydrologic routing. And yet it is a formula that is not very much known by hydraulic engineers. And that is a testament to the fact that unsteady flow and routing is not used a whole lot. Why isn't used a whole lot? Not so much because it may be too sophisticated, but because people that are practicing don't know about it. And they have now got, gone to school and back and so forth. So it's not very well known. A testament to what I'm saying in here is that in year 1987, the Army Corps invited me to give a lecture out there, which is, by the way, is on the web. The, my, the lecture that I gave in 1987. And uh, at the end of the lecture, there were two lectures. And I was supposed to talk about approximate models of flood routing. And at the end of the lecture, one of the gentlemen out there, there were 40 people from the entire United States engineers attending the lecture. And one of them, and he was standing, he was sitting in the back, uh, uh, raised his hand to, to ask a question. And he wanted to know how did I spell seven? Because he said that he never heard of the gentleman. Now, for a guy in the mid-career, standing in front of his peers and coming up and saying that he never heard of the, of the gentleman seven is a testament to what I just said. None of the other people knew either, okay? So I'm saying that at the time when we did this, 1987, it, has not, it was not very well known, and that's why the Army Corps invited me to go out there. Okay, so it's a fundamental issue. But interestingly enough, it is not the only issue that has been buried due to its perceived difficulty uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in hydraulics. There's other issues out there that we don't have time to cover right now, but that's one of them. Okay, so the beta, how is the, the beta now, as we know, is part of the Southern law. So how does the beta vary? And I have in here an example to calculate the beta for a triangular channel. So I urge you to go over this and the answer would be four thirds. The beta for a triangular channel is four thirds. Now we know that there are three asymptotic, we call it fancy asymptotic, asymptotic cross sections or typical, let's say typical, typical cross sections in open channels. The Y channel, the hydraulic channel, which in which the width to the depth is more than 10, 10, 15, 20. And that's very common in nature, by the way. Nature likes width to depth of 20, 30. Um, those of you that are taking sedimentation engineering with us know that the Neobrara River that Colby used for his famous calculation had a width to depth ratio of about 130. And he was talking 15 or 20. So that's a tri and a triangular, everybody, that's rectangular channel where you have to define the width to depth ratio greater than 10 or 20. Triangular channel, everybody knows, this is a triangular channel in here. And that's four thirds. So if the, pre the, the rectangular channel is five thirds and the triangular channel is four thirds, then which cross section is three thirds? That is the $64,000 question. So in 1993, 94, I had a student that came over to me to do a thesis. And I said, we're gonna find out what's the cross section that has this beta equal to three thirds. And we did find that out. We actually set up a calculator and so forth. We, just, we discovered everything that related to the three thirds. We call that in, an inherently stable channel because no rollways were gonna develop in this channel because the cross section had by definition a Vedernikov number of an infinite, infinite number, or rather, I'm sorry, the fruit number. The fruit number had to be infinite or say very large, 100, 200. And no calculation would ever get to fruit 200. 
the largest fruit that you, you could ever find in nature would be around 20. And why so? Because we know from our equation, S equal FF squared, remember I said that that is my, my friction equation, okay? That uh, as the uh, fruit number increases, the friction has to decrease. And since there is a bottom, a floor for the decrease of friction, there has to be a ceiling or high value for the fruit number because the slope is constant, right? So all these things were, were kind of uncovered, not discovered by uncovered, but by us over the course of 30 to 40 years of career and research. As a matter of fact, step by step, we didn't do it in one night. It was done in many, many years. So the lateral lymph flow, we need to do this equation with lateral lymph flow because eventually we knew that we were going to do the overland flow. And the overland flow, this equation over here, 943, is fundamental for the average inflow. For, I'm sorry, for the lateral inflow. Applicability of kinematic wave. There was my professor, Wilheiser, who had dealt with this subject in the middle 60s. And I think I already mentioned the fact that he was over at Cornell under Liggett, Professor Liggett, and Liggett had told uh, Dave at the time, a young man, to um, research the dynamic wave for application to overland flow. And, and Will Heiser himself told me, because I met him with him personally many times, he said that he tried for a couple months, three months, and he couldn't get thing, the thing to work or he couldn't make any sense of it. And he told, he went back to Liggett and told him that uh, that wasn't gonna lead anywhere and he needed to graduate. So they kind of uh, uh, reduced the scope to kinematic waves. That's fascinating, interesting, totally amazing. Why? Because dynamic waves is the more complex, diffusion waves and kinematic waves. So why didn't they go to diffusion waves? They could have done to diffusion waves. The answer is because they didn't know at the time. There was no diffusion waves at the time that Wilheiser made his decision with Liggett in the, in the early 50s, 60s, say 63, 64, or perhaps 65, I think it was 65, okay? So then the applicability of a kinematic wave is something that, that Wilheiser started. And then we proceeded and we proceeded and we came up with a somewhat better complex, more and better formula for the channel routing because he was talking about the plane routing, the overland flow. So we came up with this 1944 for the channel routing. Okay, so that's the, in short, what I have said about, uh, said about kinematic waves. It's a very long story. It, obviously we cannot cover all the ins and outs. Now, diffusion waves, diffusion wave equation. What does, how does diffusion and kinematic wave equations differ? The diffusion wave has a, has a gradient in there. If you forego this d, delta del, dx over d, dy over dx, then you end up kinematic. So the diffusion wave adds one more term. So since it has added one more term, it is purportedly more accurate, or I guess you could say it cover, covers a broader range of practical problems. That's a better statement. It's not more accurate. It just covers a broader range of practical problems. So the diffusion wave. As to what is the, how did the name diffusion wave originated? I do not know that for a fact, but I know that Mr. Kunch, when he went to Colorado State in the year 1973, he preceded me for a couple of months. He went over and gave a, a, a series of lectures in, the, in July of 1973 at Colorado State. And I arrived in August, so I missed it. But I got the information that he had put together. And there it, therein, in that information was the issue of diffusion. I'm not gonna say that Kanj uh, christened it because the word diffusion already appeared in the work by Lighthead and Woodham in 1954. But then one thing led to another and when I wrote my paper in 1977, I decided to call it diffusion wave. And it stuck because now people consider that the concept that we put together, this concept, equation 1945, the com a component of the diffusion wave. So now we have kinematic diffusion. The other one is something that we will talk about later on. Uh, actually, we don't have the time to talk about it here. Let me just say that the third wave would be the dynamic wave of Fred, of Danny Fred, 1973. So now we have the complete set, kinematic diffusion dynamic, with the issue that of the existence of the dynamic wave is still up to question. And I won't get into there at, at this time because we don't have the time, but I will just leave it at that hanging for a while. Actually, I will get to it maybe this uh, Wednesday or next Monday, because we are going to cover it. So how do we develop the diffusion wave? And here again, here again, I had to get into complexity in, in, a, in an introductory book. 
So I figured that this part of, our, of the book is not really read by a, whole lot of, by a whole lot of people, but I did develop equation 958, which is a diffusion wave. This is a diffusion wave of, of Kanj, and it is a diffusion wave of Hayami with minor differences in approach. But it is, it is a wave that in one equation, 958, considers um, both uh, terms, the, both, both terms, the, the friction, the gravity, and the pressure gradient. That's by definition. Well, to us, what Hayami did in 1951 in Japan and Kaj did in, say, 1973, wherever he was, he was, I think he was in France out there, out there in France, because this is, this is directly from Kaj's work. Okay, and the hydraulic diffusivity is the diffusivity of Hayami, which is 959, meaning it's defined as Q naught, lowercase q, uh, discharge per unit of width over two S sub zero. And that's the definition for a very fundamental equation. The pair, the comparison, I guess you can say the companion to the Southern formula. So without the Southern formula and the Hayami formula, you couldn't do anything in routing. In routing floods, you can't. They have to be accepted by that. And a, a story that I would uh, tell you at this time, you know, about Professor Ponce has tons of stories. I was in Brazil back in the year 1993 and I was given the job to briefly kind of cursory evaluation of a thesis, of a PhD thesis that has done a lot of flood routing with using GIS in some kind of application out there. And it turned out, I, I reviewed the thesis and it turned out that uh, the gentleman that was writing the thesis had never mentioned in his thesis, neither Seven or Hayami. So I basically went and told him that they were wrong. They can't do flood routing without mentioning these two gentlemen and put them there, putting them in the forefront. Otherwise you're doing, I don't want to say it, but uh, you're not doing it correctly. You're doing number crunching, but it's not correct. It's not mechanics. It's not physics. The mechanics and physics are given, governed by the Seddon and Hayami formulas. Applicability of diffusion wave. We went ahead and did, uh, as Wolheiser had done for the kinematic waves, we did the diffusion wave. We kind of followed on the trails or the heels of, of what he had done. So that leads us to the Muskingum method, Muskingum Kanj method long history on this method, very much not understood, if, I, if we don't want to say misunderstood, by a lot of people, a lot of practitioners. Believe me, I know what I'm talking. I, I interact, interact with a lot of people in this field. The muskingum Kanch method. Kanch developed the Muskingum method. Now, Muskingum, the, the improvement of the Muskingum method in 1969, okay? But he was involved in so many other things that he presumably never paid too much attention to it. And then in the year 1976, 75 actually, so five years later, 69 to 75, the British working out of Wallingford, I believe this was think tank in, in London, discovered or endorsed the Muskingum method and called it Muskingum dash conch. So Professor Pons didn't call it Muskingum dash conch. It was the British, 1975. Then in 1977, 78, we decided to come up in ASCE, I believe for the first time with the treatment of the muskingum Kanch method. And um, we at that time kind, kind of popularized the, norm, the term for the, uh, the American practitioners. But nothing happened until 1990, 12 years later, which is when the Army Corps introduced the Muskingum Kanch into their practice. Because prior to 1990, they were using only the Muskingum and the kinematic wave. See, the Muskingum 1938, it was an empirical method, totally based on hydrology. It was not mechanics, it was not hydraulics, okay? And, and then came the kinematic wave, which is numerical analysis, mechanics based on 1955, but it was just a wave that was only going to do the convection, not the diffusion. So if you ever had to do the diffusion, it wasn't gonna work accurately. It was gonna work in the mean, kind of in the ballpark. Okay, so that, that, that kinematic wave. Then the Muskingum Kanch came about in 77, 78, 78 actually in the US, but it was not until 1990 that it was adopted by the Army Corps. So now practitioners have to use or have to contend, I guess the word is contend with the Muskingum Kanch in HMS. Because when you use HMS and you, you wanna do routing, and you can do channel routing or watershed routing, you're gonna be, you're gonna have an option of using the Muskingum Conch and you're gonna to have to know the Muskingum Conch. 
Otherwise, if you don't know what you're using, imagine what would happen. So we're here to kind of explain briefly what is the Muskingum Conch. So the Muskingum Conch is basically a way of saying, hmm, we are solving the kinematic way, but there is some diffusion. And Conch has told us how to calculate the diffusion. So we're going to use Conch's formula to calculate the diffusion. And that is, in fact, what we're doing here. And which one is Conch's formula? It's this one, 967 which says that the numerical diffusion coefficient of the Muskingum scheme is derived. Now, I should say that uh, my hat to Mr. Conch or Dr. Conch, and I'm not sure if he's a professor. No, no, he's not a professor. He may teach out there, but he's not technically a professor. He's out of Grenoble in France. He came up with this equation in 1967. When I first read this, this paper back in the year 77, I believe, I, I was just, uh, it was out, outstanding or uh, astounding that, that that had been done. The mathematics was tremendous and the correctness of it proved that, or rather the, the, the approach was correct because at the time we were scratching our heads as to how we were gonna solve this problem. And believe me, I was scratching my head. I thought at the time, and I'm gonna confess to you that if Kant hadn't done it, I would have done it maybe a year or two later, but he had done it already. So I said, well, you know, he's the one that, he's the guy that was, already did what I had intended to do. So in other words, to find this equation 967. So now we give this equation 967 and in the, on the basis of this equation, we can then match that with the Hayami formula because this was numerical diffusivity and the Hayami formula was physical diffusivity. So all we needed to do is to match those equations to come up with a guess a very good guess, mechanical, physical guess of what the X should be, the X of the Muskingum method. And this is the formula that we presented back in the year 1977, which very similar, very close, actually exactly the same as the British. It was not the equation that Kanch had presented. But here is the issue again. Kanch never finished the work. Whether he knew what he was doing or not, he, the British had to come afterwards and pawns to finish his work and put it in, an, in a way that it could be clearly understood. And even then, it's still difficult. And why is it difficult? Because people had a hard time swallowing the fact that when you crunch numbers, you create diffusion. People have a hard time understanding what diffusion is, but diffusion is a process in nature that obliterates things. If things rise, they then diffuse, right? That we understand that in English, right? But in, in numerical, in the computer, in the, in the CPU, when working at just with numbers to create diffusion? What is that? Well, back in the year 1968, there was a gentleman working out of computational fluid dynamics, his name was Hirt, who actually came up with the first paper on that. He says, I think his paper is called On Numerical Viscosity. Numerical? Viscosity? Yes. Viscosity is diffusion? Yes, exactly. If you are, the viscosity, diffusivity, coefficient of viscosity, coefficient of diffusivity, coefficient of diffusion is the same thing. So Hirt came up, and I do not know, and I venture to say that he did not know Kanch, neither Kanch knew Hurd. What was the problem? That Hurd was working out of computational fluid dynamics. Kanch was working out of engineering hydraulics. They probably did not meet, at least in the literature. I'm guessing here. But they were both out there in the forefront in the late 60s, uh, describing what is numerical diffusion. Now we know that when you run up a whole lot of numbers, in the computer, which we do all the time, you can and you will create numerical diffusion. If there's a wave in there, the wave will diffuse. It will diffuse numerically, even though it doesn't have any physical concept or stance in there. You can have numerical diffusion. And that's exactly what happened with the kinematic wave that was put together early in 1965 by several people, Will Heiser, um, the guy working, uh, what is uh, the, uh, the book? Uh, Wooding, the Wooding book, and also Shockey. Dr. Shockey was working out of um, Princeton, 1955, together with, um, actually they were at the same time, working at the same problem at the same time in three different places, Shockey, Wilheiser, and Wooding, on the solution, numerical solution of the kinematic wave equation. And, and they were working with these issues here, but they were solving the kinematic wave, not the diffusion wave. And that's where the problem lied after the fact, because then the Army Corps came and said, we're gonna use the kinematic wave because the scientists had told us that we should use it. 
fine, yeah. But it was wrong because it, it was like the convex. It was exactly like the convex. The only problem is that the convex, convex method, the people that developed the convex method never realized that they were actually working with numbers because they thought it was hydrology. While the other guys were working with hydraulics and they really felt that they were working with numbers. So therefore they started calling it diffusion, but they were the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. We had to come in later to clarify all this stuff. Okay, so we have an improved version in here. I'm not gonna dwell on this. There are calculators for both the Muskingum as well as the Muskingum Gunch. So I urge those of you that are interested to check the calculators out. That's basically it. And we have an example in here, an example of the Muskingum Gunch method, right? And in the Muskingum Gunch method, we do not give X, X or K. While in the Muskingum method, we have to give X and K. If we go back in the book, to the Muskingum, you'll see that we have solved the problem and we have to give X and K, the two parameters of the Muskingum method. So how do we find those? Well, this is the issue here, a very important issue, by the way. In the old Muskingum method, 1938 McCarthy, you didn't, any, you didn't know anything about the fact that you were solving mus uh, kinematic waves. It was just a wave, a flood wave that needed to be modeled, right? So therefore, um, they said the only way we're going to figure out the K and the X, particularly the X, because the K, everybody had a hunch that it, it was related to the travel time because it had the components of velocity and so forth, right? But the X was a mystery at the time. Mystery to McCarthy, 1938. So then what they did is that they had a hydrograph in fr from a system, from a, from a reach, a channel, from a river reach. They had a hydrograph coming in and a hydrograph going out. And they they set up a procedure to calculate the possible X from the input and the output. And that's in my book, by the way, in, in this same chapter, in the same chapter of channel routing. So it was a hydrologic model, a hydrologic method, because it required that you have hydrologic data, a gauged measurement, input and output in order to back calculate. That's exactly what they were doing. They back calculating the K and the X. And they did it that way. But then what happened if you didn't have any data? Well, if you didn't have any data, uh, McCarthy and, and the people that followed him, among them, Linsley, professor at Stanford, had recommended that we sh shoot between 0.2 and 0.3. And even in their book, in their book they say, uh, for lack of anything better, use 0.2 or 0.3 and run with it and see how, what, happened, what happens. That's what they said in 1955, 56, in their book, Professor Linsley. Linsley, Collar, and Paulus working out of Stanford, okay? But that was proven, of course, 20 years later to be not quite correct, but there was the way they did it at the time. So prior to Muskingum Kanch, the Muskingum more or less guessed on the K because it was well-behaved, and then they guessed wildly on the X, okay? But then came Muskingum Kanch. And in the Muskingum Kanch, the situation is totally different because in here, we don't need any gauge. We're gonna work with the rating with a rating calculated from the cross section, because the cross section has a rating, cross section has a has a cross set, has a channel slope, and it has a cross section, and that determines the rating. So if we can find the rating, we can find the beta, and we can find everything. We don't need the hydrology. We can go strictly with the hydraulics. The issue is this: it's a practical issue. While people can argue that if we don't have gauge data, we're not going to get any good anything good, and that is correct. The other argument still stands. If we cannot find, find physical data, where are we gonna go? We need physical data. We don't have any physical data. Do we or don't we? And the answer is we do. We have GIS, we can go to the field, we can do all sorts of things to find out what the cross sections look like. That's the good part. The downside is that the cross sections need to be representative of the reach. If they're not representative, then you're, then you're back to basics. So it has to be representative of the reach. So people who use this method have to be very conscious of the representativeness of the data that they're using. Hydraulic data, there's no hydrologic data anymore. Hydraulic data, but they have to be representative. In other words, you gotta go to the field, you gotta examine the reach, you gotta find out where is the representative. And by the way, with GIS now that could be readily done. I'm not a GIS expert, but I know that GIS can do absolutely anything that has to do with handling of images, okay? So that's the answer to this stuff in here. That's the answer to this stuff. So, so needless to say, we are sold on the Muskingum Gunch method. We believe it should be the way to go in terms of hydraulic routing. 
and also hydrologic routing. And I'm gonna say something interesting and fascinating, but at any rate, we are sold on the Muskingum Gunch method and we do believe that it is the way to go. Why are we so, so sold on this method? Because we have used it many times and it works beautifully. When you know what you're doing, it works beautifully. It is for one thing, grid independent, meaning you cannot, you get, a, you get the same answer to the problem. One problem, consistently the answer, regardless of the size of the grid, of the grid within limits, okay? Within limits, anything is done within limits. Within limits, if, if you vary the size of the grid, it's fine. The method consistently reproduces. It's, it's, it refers to its grid independence, which is what we should look for in a model. Anybody that uh, worth a salt recognizes that if the method is not grid independent, it's no good. Because if you change the grid, which is artificial, and get another answer, then which one of the answers is correct, right? And that's an issue that led my colleague and friend, Fred Thur, when he went back to uh, SES back in the late 70s to tell them that the convex method was no good. And they said, Fred, prove us that what you're saying is correct. He said, well, it's not really independent. So then, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. If I, I, I could have been there. Then he had to define for them what grid independence was. And once they figured out that he was correct, then they said, yeah, right, Fred, this, you're correct. We understand that you cannot say, we're gonna uh, 10, 10 mile reach, we get an answer. Now we're gonna get two five square mile reaches. And we're gonna route from the beginning of the first five miles to the end of the first five miles and take that input, then take that output as input to the second reach and then get the answer at the end of the total reach, which is 10 miles. And if you did what Fred called sub-stepping, if you did one, one answer, that is one reach, you will get one answer. And if you did two, two reaches, we'll get two answers and a, a second answer. And if you did three reaches, it will get a third answer, yet a third answer. So the answer depended on the grid size and that was no good. That should have rang a bell from the beginning. But of course, from the beginning, 1954, but the people that were doing this in 1954 over at SES did not know. They did not know, simply did not know. That's the only way we could interpret this. Okay, so that's the brief history on the Muskingum, the Muskingum conch and the, uh, the diffusion waves. No, I'm sorry, the kinematic waves, the diffusion waves in the Muskingum conch with the uh, convex method and Atkin included in there. So now the history, a little bit of the history. Back in the year 1986, we came out with our famous diffusion wave modeling of catchment dynamics. And that must have raised some, eye, some eyebrows over at the Army Corps, Davis, because they had never done that. They had done kinematic wave modeling of catchment dynamics, encouraged by the work uh, of um, Shockey at MIT, Shockey and his associates at MIT, 1973. They did the kinematic wave modeling of catchment dynamics, which the Army Corps introduced in 1980 into their HEG-1 model. 1980, they, no, 1979. The HIN1 model came up with the kinematic wave model of catch and dynamics. But then in 1986, we came up with the diffusion wave model. And they must have raised eyebrows with the Army Corps up at Davis, including my friend Arlen Feldman. And Arlen said, you know what? I know this guy, Ponce. Let's invite him. So they, a year later, they invited me because I happen to know personally Arlen Feldman. They invited me to go out there and tell him about the Muskingum Conch, which somehow they had missed because this was 87. And remember the British, did I say 1976? Yeah, 1975. At any rate, you know, nobody knows everything all the time. So I told them in, 1970, in 1987, the story of the Muskingum of Gunch. And then they worked at it and they verified it. And by the way, this is interesting that by the time SES had already gotten word of the Muskingum of Gunch and they were working on it and they spent five years verifying what I had said to them in 1981. 1985 actually was five. And in 1985, the people at SES came up with a, with a finding. The, they said, Ponce is right. Absolutely. Great independence. That's what we should look for. And, and Muskingum Kanch has great independence. Okay. So then the Army Corps said, oh, this is good. And we, are, we already have our, our colleagues over at SES endorsing this stuff. So they went ahead and in 1990, they came up with the endorsement of the Muskingum Kanch over at their shop. They actually came up with the new edition, the new version. Every five to 10 years, they come up versions. I know 
the head versions are 68, 73, 79, and I believe 90, 90. They didn't have anything between 79 and 90. When they came up in 79, I'm sorry, at 90, and then subsequently in 1998, because you guys would know that HEC1 is in 1990, but HMS, which is the, the rewrite or representation or presentation in GUI form, GUI or raster form of the vector form that was in HEC1 in 1998. So what has been said in 1990 was said in 1998, basically. And I'm gonna show you the 1998, but it is the same as 1990. Now they're talking about the Muskingum Kunch model introduced for US practice in the year 1990. And what do they have in here? They have the same equations that we have. But there, of course, Miller and Kunch, we actually learn from other people, of course. Everybody learns from other people. Miller and Kunch, 1975, came in this. There was a famous uh, uh, conference in 1975 that I attended at Colorado State, all the big guys. I was, a, I was a rookie person over 1975. And all the big guys of the time showed up, Miller and Kunch and so forth. Okay, I visited with Kunch physically maybe three or four times over the course, no, three times over the course of my career. Uh, the gentleman is still alive, by the way. He's a boarding 90 now. He's in France. So they came up with these equations and as you can see these equations paraphrase uh, what I had just told you earlier. Then I have these equations over here and then the parameters of Kanch and then they mentioned my name, interestingly, why? Because Kanch never wrote this equation. They, he didn't write this equation, the British did it in 1975. But see, I cannot oblige these people to quote properly. They should have quoted, they should have said Kanch, the flood studies report of the British and Ponce, because theirs was earlier, 1975. But they didn't do that. They just put Ponce in there. I don't know. You know, they gave you the recognition, perhaps undeserved. No, not really, because we were working kind of together or parallel to what the flood studies people had done. So basically, that's in my book, as you can see. And in addition to that, there's some accuracy conditions that are written in some of my papers, which they basically mentioned me throughout. They mentioned. So this is kind of to show you that the Muskingum Kanj is not a pariah. It is out there in the middle of the profession. The problem is that it's difficult to understand because the concept of numerical diffusion is to put it plainly obtuse, meaning hard to swallow, okay? Not for me. <laughs> I, I was very young when I understood it completely what exactly it did. Because when I came to Colorado State, I'll tell you a story here, 1973, the first thing Professor Mahmoud said, he said, here are the equations, here's the double sweep, and you saw the matrix. And I said, oh, okay, fine. And then he said, and this is the Prizman scheme, which you're gonna use. That was not kinematic wave, it was a Prizman scheme, okay? So I put together the equations, the Prizman scheme, and the double sweep. And those three tools were, would allow me to do the sediment routing. And the double sweep has a little gimmick in there. <laughs> That's the only way to call it, a gimmick, which is a theta factor which those of you that have taken computational hydraulics with me last year would realize the theta weighting factor. So we started fiddling with the weighting factor and find out what was gonna give it to us. What, what, what was it gonna do for us? Because we already knew from the works of Kanj and Priceman that was gonna control the computation. And we said, oh, how interesting, control the computation. Why the, does the computation need to be controlled in the first place? And the answer is if you don't control the computation, it dies on you. It, 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 it gives you garbage, basically. You start generating, uh, spurious, spurious uh, oscillations and stuff, and it could drop on you in no time. So you have to control the computation. You, use, you have to use an aspirin. It is properly an aspirin. I, I, the analogy is a broad analogy, but it's a can it, generally good analogy. If you apply a lot of weighting factor, you will obliterate the computation and it, it wouldn't look like the same person, but it would be a person, meaning it would still be there. It would not have dropped completely and become some sort of haywire answer, right? So we learned that. So we already knew numerical diffusion. If you want to find out what numerical diffusion is, all you need to know is to run Hegras. And I'm going to get there Wednesday or, or next Monday, is to run Hegras. And Hegras is going to say, give us the weighting factor. And if you don't give them the weighting factor, they'll use a weighting factor. They'll use 0.6. And if, if, if your problem doesn't run with 0.6, then they'll recommend that you increase it to 0.7. How does that work? Well, I mean, I can't explain to you all the in, ins and outs, but that's the way it works. It's, a, it's an aspirin 
that is designed to control the computation and eliminate high frequency perturbations that could plague the computation. And you want an answer. You're working for somebody. You don't want to tell that somebody that, you know, I'm sorry, I couldn't get any answer. See you later. No way. You had to get an answer. That's why you were hired to think through these things and get an answer. So you need to use that theta factor to your advantage without killing the problem. And that is the reason how we, that's the way how we learned about the numerical diffusion. So when I came up with the Kanja, uh, the Kanja approach, the, the concept of numerical diffusion was not at all foreign to me. Actually, it was very, I was very familiar with that subject. Then the next issue is analytical verification. This actually has a video, but I thought I would, I would do the, the vector instead of the video. The video is there for you to see, but the vector is, is kind of a semi-vector form, so I figured I'm gonna do the vector too. Okay, so this article is an online enhanced version of a paper of essentially the same content entitled Analytical Verification of Muskingum Cancer Rally. There it is. There it is, 1996, Lohani and Sheikhin. Lohani is a gentleman from, from India that came to work with us for four months, and Sheikhin was a student at the time. Yes, he was one of our students. <laughs> I don't know where, Curtis, Curtis is his name. I remember his name to this day. It's 25 years. Curtis Sheikhin and Anil K. Lohani helped me do this work. Okay, so how does this whole thing start? When Sheikhin came up and Lohani came up back in the year 1995, I believe, Right, because the date of this is 1996. Uh, they both came up and, I, and, and of course they wanted to write papers because that's what they wanted to do. And I said, I have an issue here. People doubt the Muskingum Kanj, even to that day. They were saying poppycock. Well, believe me, there was a, there was a discussion over, uh, dated I believe 1988 in ASC Hydraulics Division that said that all this MC hydrology was was, uh, they didn't use poppycock, they used some, some other word, but it was the, the derogatory, demeaning. They said that they didn't understand, no, it's not that they didn't understand, they would have uh, recognized weakness. They just said, no, this is a number crunching, number playing around with numbers, which is correct by the way, we'll play, but we are playing correctly. So I said to them, I have a theoretical solution based on my S curve and we can pose a, a um, we can pose a, a sinusoidal wave. We can, we can pose a sinusoidal wave and then find a theoretical solution because a sinusoidal wave has the advantages. It's very well behaved in its transport. It's a celerity and attenuation and we can measure the attenuation. And besides the attenuation that we were doing with our S-curve was sinusoidal anyway. Because typically the waves that are out there in nature are not sinusoidal. They have a tendency to be gamma functions, which is a, a superimposition of, of several sinusoids together, slagged a little bit or lagged a little bit in time. But no big deal. I said, this is theory we're proving. What we're going to prove in here is that if we impose a sinusoidal wave and we come up with a typical problem, and we chose a Thomas problem, which is a very well respected trial problem in our field, in the field of flood hydrology. Everybody knows the Thomas problem, 1934. And then we apply our equation, our theoretical equations of the S-curve, and we, and we run an example, and we should find what the S-curve says that it should get and what the model the sinusoid is getting and compare how different they are or how close they are. And I felt that I wasn't on the right track. It had to be close. So we did it. And this is the paper that shows that in fact, we analytically verify the Muskingum Kanj so as to defy the people that do not believe in the accuracy of this method. So this method is not only grid independent, which is already a testament to its accuracy, but it is also correctly in the analytical answer. Because you could argue that, oh, okay, fine, it's grid independence, but it gets to the wrong answer. No, it is grid independence and it gets to the right answer. I'm really surprised at this point, 25, 30 years later, that it's still not made it to prime time. It really has not made it to prime time yet, but it will eventually. Maybe generation Z or something like that, it would take. But the point is that now I already explained to you what we're gonna do and we are going to do it. Muskingum Kanch has been for many years successfully applied in flood routing based on the, 
the masking gamma routing parameters were theoretically derived by Kant based on the approximation error obtained by a Taylor series expansion of the grid function. Okay, although the parameters have been shown to work reasonably well, they're linked to the analytical expressions for wave celerity and hydraulic diffusivity have yet to be demonstrated in an actual routing application. Talking about this, what is routing and how can we use it? And the answer is, is it hydraulics or hydrology? That is a big question. The answer is, while it has the looks of hydraulics, in fact, it is hydrology. That's what 30 years of experience have shown me. It is hydrology. So it should be used in hydrologic problems. Hydrologic problems, not hydraulic problems. Why, why am I saying that? Well, the Maskingham Gunch is used in HMS, which is a hydrologic model. So correctly, that is what I just said. It is not used in RAS, which is a hydraulic problem. So the Maskingham Gunch really is hydrologic, not hydraulic. Not that it matters for you. I mean, we're gonna, if we're gonna use it, we're gonna use it. And if, if it's necessary for us to use it, we, could, we should use it. But I'm saying this, let me reiterate, that it's going to come up in hydrologic problems, catchment routing, basin routing. And it's not going to come up in hydraulic problems. It will come up if you wanted to, but very few people are gonna sit to write a program out there, particularly those that work for consulting firms are never going to do it. And I say that with knowledge. Consulting firms are not there to develop programs. They are develop, they're there to use programs. The only persons that would be in the business, if we call it a business of developing programs, would be those people that go into school, a college, a PhD, to do something new, something better. Then you would sit down and choose a language and so forth. This paper endeavors to test the Maskingham Gunch by comparing the analytically derived flow wave celerity with those using the actual numerical application. The remarkable agreement between analytical and numerical results in indication of the accuracy of the model. I close, I thought I was going to get with three, four, five, within three or four, five percent, and I was going to be happy. We actually got less than one percent, I think 0.5 percent, something like this. Given the fact that hydrologic computations are admitted, uh, we have to admit that 20, 30 percent is the norm and tolerance for error, less than one percent is almost perfect. Okay, so we have the background. Which are the background in here? The C and D coefficients, which are expressions for, this, for the current speed, I'm sorry, the Seddon, the Seddon speed and the diffusivity of Hayami. Here is the Seddon speed right here, C, compared to the grid resolution. And here is the Hayami speed without the two compared to conscious diffusion. This CDX is conscious numerical diffusion. And this Q over S of O is Hayami's physical diffusion. The definition is the C and the D. Now, I call it C and D because I thought that that was the right way to do it. Durand has already been recognized. The cell Reynolds number was not recognized at the time, but I did it anyway. Uh, I actually borrowed the term from, from a book, 1972 book by, I don't remember the name right now. There was a 72 book that was talking about the cell Reynolds number, but in, the, in connection with fluid dynamics. But nevertheless, I needed a D in there and I borrowed this, okay? Unfortunately, this nomenclature notation has not been endorsed by the Army Corps. If you look at the stuff that I showed you earlier, there's no way of C and D in there. I don't know why they did that. I honestly don't know. They, for, they didn't want to get into the C and D. I don't know. I would venture to say that this was gonna comp exceedingly complicate the presentation. That's it. Or exceedingly simplify as you, as you you can be my guest as to what exactly is it, why exactly is it that the Army Corps did not endorse the use of CND, which I think is the best way to do it. But here's the definition, okay? So the analytical model, here's the analytical model in here. The wave attenuation follows an exponential decay function. And this, this gets really into the S curve, so it's really complicated, so bear with me. The amplitude propagation, Pons and Simons, that's my S curve. The dimension is wave number. This over here is the crux of the whole thing. I could have never done what I did without this equation number 12, which is the non-dimensionalization of the wavelength of the, of the, of the phenomenon. And the non-dimensionalizing non, non parameter is the L sub naught, which was first presented by Leighton and Whittem in their 1954 paper, but they didn't touch it. Why is it that they didn't touch it? I've studied that. Well, Leighton and Whittem, uh, excellent people, but they, they had a choice to take. 
A route or B route. And they took B route and they got entangled out there with the heavy side theory or heavy side theorem or something like this, which I many times have tried to understand and have not been able to, but they didn't get anything anywhere or they didn't get it anywhere as clear as I was able to get with my approach was, which was based on, on perturbation theory. Okay, so long story made short, we got the numerical testing program. We are going to use the Thomas problem, okay? Which is this problem over here, 14, the discharge expressed with an exponent of the rating five thirds, which is corresponds to Y channel. I remember already five thirds. And the 0.688 is just a number that rep represents the friction in the cross section. And with a Manning N of 0 0.0297 that is back calculated from the 0.688 that was presented by Thomas in 1934. Who was Thomas? Thomas was a gentleman working out of the university Saturday on the East Coast. And he wrote a very famous paper trying to do things. And he did a quite a few things, but not quite, not quite. He didn't develop the Muskingum. The Muskingum was developed in 1938. But he's, the great thing about Thomas is that he put together this problem, which is a very well recognized and easy to handle problem. Again, the KISS principle. His, his problem was easy to handle. It was not a very complex theoretical problem. He said, I have a sinusoid and these are the parameters. So we use this, okay? And we came up with the answers in here. We ran the whole thing. We have a model to do that. And we ran the whole thing and this is the answer. This is what we came up with. That's the inflow. This is the inflow over here from 50 CFS to 200 and 96 hours of a flood wave, the transport rather of the movement of the flood wave. So there's a celerity in here and there is an associated diffusion over here, which is typical in a flood wave. Most flood waves attenuate between zero and 30% within a flood length or rather um, one wavelength of propagation. Over here, we get almost to the one wavelength. If this, this tail had been over here, it would have been one wavelength, but we didn't do it that way. So within certain amount of propagation, so between zero and 30%, we are here within maybe 20%. So it's fine, we're there within the range. If it's zero attenuation, then we have a kinematic wave. No doubt about it. And if we have more than 20, 30%, the wave may not be diffusion, it will be actually a dynamic wave. The typical dynamic wave with, with, with obliterate in no time, like uh, in no, it dissipated. It, it formed part, the, the, the mass of the wave, the energy dissipated and the mass went to, went to form part of the underlying base flow. So this, if, if it had dissipated dynamically, the thing would have raised the level over here a little bit because it would be distributed throughout, right? But it didn't. So we're fine. We still have a diffusion wave. So now let's compare the answers so that I can prove to you that in fact, our answers are with less than 1%. So what are we having here? Number one is analytically computed values based on diffusion wave theory. That's my S curve. Number two, numerically generated values using constant parameter masking and Kanch model, which I have. The analytical value 87.95, the numerical value 88.04, 88, .04, 88 or four divided by 87.95, 1.001. So the error is one per thousand, marvelous, amazing. Okay, I'm gonna do another one over here. Okay, at 500, at, at, at distance of 500 miles, 200 miles, 500 miles, 96, 48, I'm gonna do this one, 90, uh, 91.6 divided by 91.57, you can almost, 1.0003, so three per 10,000. So when I said less than 1%, <laughs> I didn't wanna you know, lie to you. I said, well, less than 1%. This is less than 0.1% or even less than 0.01% error. Marvelous, absolutely amazing that we could do this calculation and show such agreement between theory and practice. Because this is theory and practice. Okay, so with that, I finish in here. I say this the same thing. So I finish in here. I've proven to you that the Maskingam Kanch method works well, not only in practice, but also in theory. Okay, so now I'm going to finish in here in the next five minutes that I have, that I'm going to describe to you an application of this method that we did in the year 2008 in Peru. This is an interesting and fascinating problem, particularly for those of you that are in the, in the professional field. How do you do, how do you set up a model or set up a project to do this? I was charged 
um, the, the, the story of this is there was a company in LA that, that won the, the feasibility, the feasibility study of a dam in Northern Peru in the year 2008. And I got, I got charge of the hydrology. I was supposed to develop the, um, the hydrograph, the three hydrographs that are usually used, uh, uh, mid-size, high and very high hydrograph for the design of the spillway. Because you have to have a spillway that will spill the water on a certain frequency. And so I was charged with the design. I had to come up with, I had to route. I had to basically uh, set up the model to route different types of precipitations, postulated precipitation. So we could come up with the flood waves, rather the, the, the floods through the spillway for the design. So that the spillway could be properly sized and calculated. So we have in here the project description, okay? This is the project description and I urge you to read this if you're interested in the practice of it. We're not just totally theory, we're also practice. Basin description, modeling strategy. Okay, here we go. There's a need to determine flood discharges associated with 100 year to 10,000 year return periods. We need to go to the 10,000 year return periods for the reason that in Peru, there is no PMF. We, they usually get to 10,000 year return periods where we consider to kind of equivalent to the PMF. Never equivalent because the PMF is absolute. The 10,000 year is relative, okay? And I said that with a grain of, a little bit of a grain of salt because the 1963 PMF values of California were updated in 1960, no, in 1998 on the second edition of the California PMF to, to increase the value. So if it took them 30, 35 years to decide to increase the value, then this PMF stuff is not absolute because we're gonna have 35 years later and they will decide again to again increase the value, okay? So long, long story made short is we are not absolutely 100% sure of everything that happens in nature. Nature's been around for a long time and we haven't. So we have to respect that. There could be possibilities of errors, despite the fact that we do our best to avoid the errors or, or, or live with the errors. So 10,000 years is what we were gonna do in here, okay? We described the model. By that time, we already had developed a model that was what HMS does. But don't forget that when we did this model, uh, this was the year 2007, but we already had a model since the 80s on this stuff. And in the 80s, HMS, I'm sorry, in HMS, HEC-1 did not have Muskingum Conch. So we felt that we were ahead if we had a model that had Muskingum Conch. So we did the model, we worked on the model, we, we developed the model. The critical part of the model, of this model that we developed, we still have it, uh, is not, and we have used it in various instances, I would say, maybe five, 10 instances, and other people, limited amount of people have actually used it. So it's a deterministic conceptual distributed event-driven rainfall runoff computation model suited for the simulation of flood flows, 1985. Yeah, we came up in 1985 with this model here on this paper, which I'm not sure that we covered here. Oh, okay, so we did the model and uh, yes, explaining here what the model does, okay? All the components of the, of the rainfall model, event-driven, I submit that the only model, model that works are event-driven. You cannot have a continuous model because it gets so complex that it's almost impossible to run. I know National Weather Service knows that. They, I, I, I believe they would hate to admit it, but a model that is a continuous model is almost impossible to run. You gotta follow it through years, the soil and the wetness and so forth. Well, the event model happens in a few, this model here in 48 hours is out. If you didn't get it in 48 hours, you didn't get it, right? So that's, that's easier to do. So my, my work has done on event-driven models. I never got into the continuous model because I always thought it was a can of worms. You'll never get the answer in a continuous model. Rainfall runoff because it, it seeks to, through a suitable transfer to convert a rain rainfall into runoff. Computational because it discretizes the governing equation in the space-time usable, a suitable scheme, which is the Muskingum Ganj, okay? And we've proven, of course, beyond any reasonable doubt that it is grid independent. So we collect the data, 
we had to come up with a with a topology. This is an interesting thing. A comment deserves a comment. We want to finish here in two minutes. Allow me a couple minutes. Um, the topology thing is not hydraulics; it's mathematics. So I had to sit down and figure out what a suitable topology is. So we created this topology, meaning how are you going to tell the computer to add up the flows? It's like in your in your body, you have your blood circulating, and the heart is pumping the blood. And the blood's not jumping from this leg to the other leg without growing to the proper channels. It has to go through the proper channels. Same thing in here. There's an order to the flow. And that order is set up by these numbers and it has to be followed. The flow goes from 20401 to 20402. It does not jump to 30501 or 30105. So that for that, you need a topology structure, which by the way, is done in HMS. So you don't have to work with, worry with it. So terrain types, this is the kind of stuff that we have out there, amazing geography. The slopes typically in the uplands is 20, 30, 40%, even 100%. This one happens to be about maybe 80%. Stone precipitation, hydrologic soil groups. This is the kind of land that you have out there. Manning's end, frequency, and finally model results. Principal spillway, 4,000 cubic meters per second. And why is it two peaks? It has two peaks because it has two two um, hydrologies out there. It's a big basin, it's 8,000, no, 900 kilometers square, okay? It's about 400 square miles. And uh, it has two sides and two hydrologies because the weather changes from one side to the other. So you have two peaks in there. Can you see the two peaks in there? Two peaks because they have two diffusion problems. And likewise in here, this is the emergency spillway and the Freeburg hydrograph, which gets all the way to 6,000 cubic meters per second. Now, um, are these okay? And the answer is, well, I mean, I've visited the, the, the basin from the top to the bottom, and I have seen the cross sections that are really huge out there. We had to come up with some, some, something that was compatible to what, house, what was out there in the field. There's huge cross sections out there. We can forego the fact and we can do a rough calculation and that's the kind of flow that those sections will pass. We've done this in many times, in many instances. So that's basically what I'm going to say in regards to this project. And I urge you to, if you're interested in learning more about how these things are done, because you may in the future, if you work in hydrology with a consulting firm, you will be able to at least consider these types of job situations. So I finish there now. Now we're done. So thank you very much.